It's Wizards vs. Lesbians, a podcast for your ears. Hello and welcome to Wizards vs. Lesbians. My name is Isaac. I'm Alexis. And today we are discussing uh, three short stories. It is our fifth short fiction roundup. Uh, the stories in question are Miss Bulletproof Comes Out of Retirement by uh, Louis Evans or Lewis Evans. Selkie Stories Are for Losers by Sophia Samatar and Nuka by Anna Hurtado. Um, and we've sort of flipped back and forth about how we handle the format for these. Um, do we want it? We'll just do little mini intros for each story, I suppose. Yeah, sure. Which one, which one do we want to do first? <laughs> well, we'll just do them in the order that you introduced them. So, Miss Bulletproof comes out of retirement. Are there wizards? Absolutely. Are there lesbians? Absolutely. Do they fight? Absolutely. Um, this is the most. This is definitely the classic Wizles story of our lineup, um, and involves a lesbian superhero, retired superhero mom who is Miss Bulletproof, who does indeed come out of retirement for one last job, uh, for a trickster god type, and it goes about as well as you can imagine. Should yeah, I think you should read this? I really enjoyed it. I didn't, so... um, Excellent. We can have a good argument about it. All right. Content warnings, torture, mutilation, and, uh, you know, threatened, threatening children. Selkie stories are for losers. Yeah, selkie stories are for losers. This is a story about a girl whose mom left because she was a selkie. um, And it's uh, about her and her girlfriend sort of uh, processing, basically. Yes. um, This is... Close. This is more. This feels to me like an inverse um, monstrous children of narcissistic parents. Yes, I would say so. This is the insufficiently monstrous child of a possibly narcissistic or possibly just desperate to escape mom. Indeed, um, and there are lesbians. Uh, not really. Yes. Not really so much wizards, except if the dad trapped a selkie that makes him a wizard. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, content warnings. There, not much. Um, bad parents uh yeah and the, um, uh, underage alcohol consumption <laughs> y- yeah drug and uh, alcohol consumption okay <laughs> um all right and uh why should you read this one i i thought it was kind of charming actually yeah it's 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 cute um and uh it's you know and it's also short so you know you're not wasting a whole bunch of your life with it actually these are all very short which i appreciate um we kind of yes that is one of the joys of short fiction yeah is that it's short but even by the standards of short fiction these are some short fictions right they're they're, which is good they're as long as they need to be so third nuka um this in a world where apparently sometimes people possibly just young women get faces growing on the back of their heads Mm-hmm. We're, in, we're in fantasy Ecuador, incidentally. Uh, yes. Three, uh, three queer women in a sort of complicated love triangle go to the magical springs where they are told they, uh, they can wash these faces off. Indeed. All, sort, all manner of lesbian drama ensues. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, uh, content warnings, body horror, pretty much that's it. Yep. And uh, Spiders. Uh, and spiders. If you have a spider phobia, there's a scene that will find you will find very distressing. Um, and there's there are no wizards unless you think of the faces on the backs of their heads as wizards, which is no. I mean, I don't think really. there I don't think there are any wizards in this one at all. This one has no wizards, but boy, does it have lesbians! It has a lot of lesbian per square inch. Um, mm-hmm. All right, and why should you read this one? I found this one to be really interesting. It has layers. It is very interesting. Um, I've it's the first story that we have, or story or novel or anything that we've read that has made me look up a whole bunch of English words. Um, this, <laughs> this person writes in an, in an aggressively uh, erudite fashion. Um, I mean, there's also just a lot of Spanish words in there. But... Yes, indeed. But it, it it's it it it, it makes it, it's clever in a number of ways. But you may need to have Google handy. Um, if you if you want to understand everything, if you're not an American, uh, if you're a native English speaker and not from America, you may find this to be a lot more Spanish than you're used to. Yes. Uh, so, uh, but I think it's worth it. Um, yeah. It's it's oh, it's an interesting little piece. It's got some great imagery. Yeah. Uh, so, 
there we go. I think I think that's that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much handled it. Shall we head off to the spoiler zone? Yes. Rushing through the format, got three stories done, everything we needed in under five minutes. It's a high way to the spoiler zone. All right. So, um, Miss Bulletproof comes out of retirement. Um, yes. Y- you were definitely right to say that this is the most classically Wizles thing that we, you know, story of the three of them. Yes. Um, so why don't why don't you tr- why don't you go first? Because I'm going to be mostly negative about it. All right. So I enjoyed this one. Um, I enjoy the voice, and I thought and I thought that the I liked it's a, I like his approach to superheroes. Um, it few it it's a I think I read I read another superhero story of his and I just feel like his superhero stories are doing something interesting with superheroes and almost everything I read that's a contemporary like superhero prose fiction just feels like pastiche and sometimes it's pastiche but look this time there's lesbians or gay boys um, and sometimes it's not even that and this does not feel like that uh, and thus I found it interesting and enjoyable. Mm. Um, I think I've, I was like, oh, um, like it didn't, they didn't even register as superheroes to me. Um, but, uh, the, the comic bookness of it is very present. Um, yes. This read to me is like, uh, firmly an American God's pastiche. Um, and I mean, Except- I know that it's not Gaiman. I know that Gaiman didn't invent this, but, right, the- but also American God's is like this is making up gods. Yes, as as was American gods. But those well, were the I mean, American gods. He made them up. But um, many of the American gods were were drawing on, like very specific. You know, Odin is still Odin. I'm afraid. Yes, um, this is true. Loki the, is still Loki. But it's the the American gods are all new gods. Um, yes, but the American gods don't have interesting names. Anyway, this is not actually a podcast about American gods. No, it's um, not. But. Actually, some of the American gods do have names, like Technical Boy. He was supposed to be the avatar of the new, like, Silicon Valley. Little did we know. Anyway, he has his own fragrance, courtesy of Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab. I got it for my friend Ryan, who said it smelled kind of like eucalyptus. By the way, did you know that I'm a scent guy? A smell evangelist? I really like matching people up with perfumes. My favorite company is Filigree and Shadow out of Seattle. But if you contact me, I'll give you a smell recommendation based on your blog. Anyway, I thought that the gods here were more interesting than the ones in American Gods, at least. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think th- I like what it felt like to me was the, the sort of story where it's like I've I've you know, I've, I've shaken out some women, um, and we're going to torture them. Um, Mm. and, uh, then, uh, the, the thing that tortured them gets killed and it's a happy ending. Um, because there's very little else to the action here. Uh, and, um, you know, it's like, if you're there, there was something that there was something that felt like, prurient and sadistic and simplified um about the whole presentation i think because it's you know it's presented as like it's presented in a sort of noir thing right Mm -hmm. um you know it's like we have this we have a, a a noir superhero she is like the ultimate butch she is you know the only thing that she cares about is her you know wife and kids um, and that's, you know, present in her superhero power. She's Miss Bulletproof. She's completely invulnerable. But the thing that happens in the story is that she gets penetrated and screams in agony. Mm. Ta-da. You know, and that's, yeah, the, that's, a, that's a, that's a pretty good, um, that, that's a, I think that's a fair critique. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's more than a little rapey. Um, and I'm like, I didn't. You know, besides the the fact that like sort of you know motherhood saves the day, you know basically, um, you know it's or the, wifehood saves the day. Wifehood, you know, but her her wife superpower is that if you like wake her up unexpectedly, she becomes this like you know ball of uh, unstoppable force, um, and otherwise is just like you know a sweet 
you know, nice woman. Uh, I didn't understand what it was, what it had to say beyond, you know, the wanting like the sort of the emotional, you know, this woman gets hurt and then gets saved, you know, part of it. I didn't understand what anything else in it was about. So the thing I liked, I think I liked about it is that it feels, it feels like just like a tiny glimpse into a much larger universe. Okay. Um, which I think perhaps helped me feel a little bit less like this needs to have, um, that, you know, but also, um, sorry, I'm a little bit brain dead today. Uh, so, but also... I feel like I don't think it's just like a motherhood or wifehood saves the day. Like you get this, it's this feeling of, ugh, I'm poor. I'm going to take a stupid job that I don't want to do because I need the extra money. And Mm -hmm. you take this stupid job and it's really crappy and awful. And you, and then, you know, and then you get, and like, then you get this sort of unrealistically deus ex machina ending of, but then your wife descends in a ball of plasma obliterates everything that made this dangerous and drives you away to safety. Um, But, you know, I don't know. It just, it felt the, the emotions of just being tired and of being like, ugh, I can't believe I have to do this. Were I thought were just very relatable and well portrayed. And that really helped give me a sense of realism to the world, despite there being literal gods and superheroes. I, I agree. Um, and to a certain extent, um, like my question, the question that I had was like, okay, uh, I, why, why are you poor, you know, with your, with your superpowers? Um, and, then that leads me to super powering doesn't pay anything. Well, I mean, I, I would imagine that it would under most circumstances, um, <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, yeah, he's actually, no, we know that it pays stuff, but the thing is that, um, I don't know. I had to give up one of my somewhat dangerous. I did not have to, I converted my somewhat dangerous hobby of free soloing waterfalls into, you know, top rope gym climbing because I'm settling down and into a marriage. So I can kind of understand the I giving up dangerous uh, bodyguarding and, you know, drug transaction type stuff because you're settling down to have two kids. I suppose so. It's it just it let me the thing the that question was like, OK, so you you know, you don't have you you worked in. You know, you worked in the criminal underground, basically. You were, you were, right. I mean, that's sort of the met- the noir metaphor that, that's, here. Yeah, is that's, that, the, that's the noir metaphor here. Is, yeah, is that you were, you know, you're sort of John Wick um, and you've been called back from one last job because somebody is, uh, you know, coming back for revenge be from your previous life, which is a story that is so old and so well trodden that it creaks um, if you, if you look at it funny. Um, Yes, but and but you know, there actually you don't really get very many women getting to be that character. I suppose this is your a, a classic story of like I, you know, that that doesn't register for me for obvious reasons, and so <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I didn't like the story when it, you know, when it didn't have lesbians in it. Right, but like this, you know, but this is the thing is that this is that story, but instead of being a man, you know, you get it gets you get to have your like middle aged woman. And instead of it, instead of it ending with the wife and children murdered, it ends with the wife murdering all of the, your enemies. Cool. I mean, I suppose that's about as ambitious as a short story can, would, you know, <laughs> would support. Uh, so, but yes, I think if 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 playing with really obvious genre tropes is not your thing, then you're going to find this one to be kind of just a retread. Um, yeah, and it's like it's also you know. We, you're, it, it, it's like, it's one of those things where, okay, it takes the trope, you know, and you're right in the trope, it would be the wife and kids who got murdered by this trickster God who does in fact threaten them. You know, that is in there. Uh, and, uh, you know, which is one of the, one of the nice things about John Wick is that it's his dog. Um, well, yes, that's his wife is already dead though. (laughs) Right. Exactly. But that's a, that's a, (laughs) I I don't know why I've got John Wick on the brain. Anyway, um, (laughs) uh, 
The answer is obviously because I like picturing Keanu Reeves' face. Yes. Uh, jingle addendum. Did you see that uh, Keanu is going to be in Waiting for Godot on Broadway with uh, with his Bill and Ted co-star? Like irrespective of acting ability, like this is far more thematically like appropriate than it was to get professor X and Magneto to do it that one time. But anyway, like, so, you know, it, it's a matter of like when you're, when you're bringing up the, the thing and deconstructing it, whether it's superheroes or whether it's like, you know, this like badass is trying to leave the old criminal life behind, but you know, it's going to catch up with him and kill him as it usually does in these stories. Um, but you're like, no, what if women, you know, <laughs> and what if we, you know, reverse some of it on his head, you still bring up a whole, like, I mean, I feel like we've had this particular, you know, argument slash discussion a whole bunch of times. Yeah. And, and we've been on, and, and we've been on different sides, depending on whether or not we personally liked the story. So oh, yeah, yeah, no, hundred <laughs> um, percent. But like in this case, it feels like, you know, the parts of those stories that are really, that's like, that are, that are what bring it along is like a the sadness and regret b the feeling about aging and then c just the brutality and torture and like it's it's one of those unfortunate cases where it's hard to bring the brutality and torture part you know through the gender swap without catching yourself on a lot of things mm, yeah no that and that's fair and uh i don't think that it pulled that off but that's just me it worked better for me, but I think that those are totally fair critiques. All right. Selkie <laughs> stories? Yes, moving right along. Um, so uh, this is this one is like, you know, it's an it's an interesting one because we don't we we have a lot of I mean, this is another one where it's like a kind of a classic, you know, meditation. Uh, like it's sort of a on classic a ma- on a trope. Yeah, on a trope. And this, where... this, and this is a much more like. The your narrator spells out for you all the different Selkie stories that she is angry about, um, yes. and thus all the different like permutations of the trope that the story is engaging with. So indeed, indeed, which you know that's it's I, I, it's charming. It cites its sources. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's there's, also there's ways to do this well and ways to do this poorly. I think that this one pulls it off. I agree, um, and there is also actually sort of fundamental, you know, a familiar story but gender swap thing because I feel like you'd when it's like the teenage girl whose life is sort of, you know, who, whose life is spiraling a little bit, it's because her dad's gone. Um, Mm, Yeah. And her mom's still there rather than the other way around. Uh, And I thought that this was a, a really interesting sort of, you know, uh, I thought there were a couple of interesting things about the way that it swaps that around. Um, And I think, that I mean, obviously it works very well with, with our, us being the the number one mom hunter podcast, but um... <laughs> well, but also I think it the, the thing is that I think it raises some interesting things because of course, um, you know, because initially it's wow bad mom she walked out, but on the other hand, it's a selkie story very specifically something you know fundamental to her identity was stolen from her, and it's only on the rediscovery that she fucks off. And yes, she leaves her child behind, but also, I mean, she, you know, if you're being basically kept a hostage in an abusive relationship and you run, you should bring your kid, but also, you know, it's, you're not necessarily a monster for not doing it. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a really, it's really nuanced there because like this character ref- refuses to blame her father. Um, right. Which I, I thought that was a really good touch because- you know, in all the stories she's telling, it is obvious that the that you know the man is the villain because he has stolen the sulky skin. But she just refuses to blame her father. She sees her father as a victim, just like her. Right. Even with all of the sort of you know, and you know, she's saying that all these stories are. She hates all of these stories, and one of the reasons that she hates all these stories is because <laughs> they blame the they blame the dad over and over again, um, and like. It's like, yes, obviously the dad is at, at fault in all of these stories, but um, let's, you know, the, the the implication of all of these stories, particularly when there are children involved, is that um, not only did 
Mama Selkie never loved the, the dude, which we can all understand, but also Mama Selkie never loved the kids. Um, yeah. And whether your mom had a good reason for not loving you. Um, it's still really devastating. It's, it's, it's still, it's an enormous psychic wound to grow up and realize that your mom didn't love you, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that, you know, despite the, how short this is, it's like, it really gets across the feeling of how, of what a, like a devastating wound that is um, and how difficult it can yeah. be to make sense of it, particularly, you know, in light of the narratives that you're going to come across around, you know, abused women and, uh, you know, and who's in the right and who gets the sympathy in these cases. Well, and it also really helps that you have her girlfriend who's dealing with her own terrible mom problems, her girlfriend whose dad has left and whose mom, like, has tried to commit suicide, leaving her daughter to find her and is like being unrealistic and is like making it clear to her daughter that, you know, the only reason that I'm still around is for you, Mona, um, which is it gives you some nice contrast because this is another example of a woman where you're like, clearly you're going through something terrible. But wow, the person you're making suffer isn't the person who made you suffer. The person you're making suffer is your teenage daughter. Right, exactly. Um, now, the the narcissistic uh mom of the girlfriend here feels super super familiar to me oh yeah um like just the just yeah. the the sheer like you know it is my drama but i need you to participate in the drama the way that she yep. goes into the restaurant to try to you know make a scene in front of her daughter and unable to find her daughter like will sort of well, okay i'll i'll make a scene in front of your uncle you know right um it's, no, uh, it's, you know, we, we're not going to turn this short fiction episode into Isaac and Alexis therapy hour, but no, I, it was extremely well depicted. I mean, it's a, this is, this is a bad parent story. We gotta, we gotta, you yeah. know, we gotta drag out the bad parent jingle, which I'll put right here. <laughs> um, Um, I hope that people have realized that I have an instrumental jingle now for the bad parent moments and that, I mean, <laughs> and that people have been paying attention to that. But if not, you know, this is the, this is what it sounds like. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, another thing that I really liked about the story was that the prose reminded me of Linda Berry. Um, mm, there is that sort of, there, no, you're right. There's that very much that like teenage confessional, but you know can't help yourself from being a little too cringe um you know it's it's his willingness to really show teenagerness in all of its messiness and with that isn't trying to like make them more adult or more childlike or more poetic or you know more stupid or whatever yeah it's like dear mona when i look at you my skin hurts and that's like a complete section like i can see that you know sort of you know, Mar uh, not Marlis, but her older sister, Arna. I can see Arna writing that in her diary if Arna was gay, <laughs> you know, it's like, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and sort of the, the griminess of it all. Um, and yeah, no, as you say, the sort of the accurate teenage thing of like, okay, I'm annoyed about my mom leaving and not loving me, but I'm also annoyed about bad customers, you know? Right. <laughs> and... <laughs> Like these are, these are just all sort of events in my life, <laughs> um, you know, and it's like, you know, we're, we have this little joke about, you know, the Norwegian grandma and, you know, that's also here. Uh, it's, it's really charming. Um, it's really charming. The, the detail of, you, you know, yeah, you'd think we'd meet my mom in Norway where there were actual seals, but no, dad met mom at the pool. <laughs> yes. Um, and you know, the, uh, like, also another thing that's, that struck me as very accurate of teenagerdom is to just, like, pick a random state, and that random state has got, you know, is sort of the promised land, because it's yeah. not here, and it's different from here. <laughs> um, yeah, and like, die anywhere they're else. They're just, like, weirdly in, you know, right, exactly, like, they're just weirdly mm -hmm. into Colorado, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Or Kuno is going like, to go live in the, in the Paris, you know, uh, mausoleums um uh, with Kuno S. uh so anyway that's enough video game references for now <laughs> um also of course shout out to miss Fr mrs frisbee and the rats of nim um love to see it 
So one other thing, though, that I really liked about this story. It is. It's very true. Um, actually, and one other thing that I want that I liked about this story is that because it's not just about, you know, being the child of a mom who abandons you and a dad who sort of emotionally abandons you. Um, mm -hmm. It's also about. It's about looking at your parents. It's about looking at a parent, particularly the one who isn't as much in your life and being like, this person has this something special and magical about them, and I don't. Yes, yes, exactly. And there's, I mean, and that's really reflected in her dad's, you know, sort of attitude toward her mother, who, like, has, you know, achieved mythical, like, the one that got away storybook status. Like, you know, he's going to Norway and trying to eat lutefisk to, you know, get a sort of a sense <laughs> of that back. And everybody's like, we don't, nobody eats that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And, you know, and like the fact that you know, like she sees the seals and the seals want to talk to her and she can't understand them. And there's this, you know, there's this sense of generational loss where your parents had something magical and you don't and you don't feel like you have it anymore. And so your choices are to either keep chasing after it, which is something that her father has sort of been doing, or to mm -hmm. reject it entirely and move to Colorado. Yes, which is the correct decision, I think. Um <laughs> I mean, they may they may find Colorado to be a disappointment, but um, yeah, no. Imagine if they end up in Colorado Springs. Um, <laughs> I mean, presumably they'll gravitate towards Denver or Boulder, but who knows? One would hope. <laughs> um, you know, wherever you can find a place to live. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I think yeah, this a, one we both a, recommend. This, it's a good one. It's a good one. Um, all right, let's move on then to the last story on the list. Uh, Nuka. Nuka. So yeah, no, this took me longer to read than the last two stories combined, despite the <laughs> fact that it's the same length as the two of them. Because uh, I just want to, I just want to to list some fun words from it because <laughs> it okay. really struck me: maculated, aralide, nevis, whelm. <laughs> Horatious. The words, the words, the words, the words. Horatious frogs? Surely not. And then I looked it up and it's like, oh no, actually, yes. Horatious, which means transparent, frogs, glass frogs. <laughs> so cool. And so I spent a lot of time looking at frogs, which may also be why it took me a long time to get through this one. Um, but yeah, no, this the, the this is taking very much taking place in a real place. You know, and there's a, a palpable sense of being in the Ecuadorian, you know, sort of jungle and uh, in the outback, as it were. Uh, so, you know, even there is a density to it, uh, both mm. in terms of its prose and in terms of sort of the 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 fog, you know, the the sort of the 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 emotions that she is, you know, sort of stuck in because they're all very. I mean, this the 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 neck. Mouth is very clearly like a coming of age metaphor kind of thing. Yeah, the the mouth, um, the the little the face that appears at the back of her neck is, you know, every so she so our protagonist and these other two women, one of whom is her best friend who she's completely in love with, and the other is her friend's girlfriend, um, and all three of them have grown faces on the backs of their heads, which is apparently something that happens, and um, it's and each of the faces are different. And mm -hmm. our narrator's face is very obviously her teenage self that she just cannot make peace with. Like it still has braces. Yes. And um, it sort of it has the 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 ring of ritual about it. And there isn't any this in this world. This is normal. Like it's it's clear that not everybody gets the faces, but you know enough people do that. Like people are going to mostly respond with like, you know, sympathy. And it's like, Oh, I, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's like having tough, some tough sort being of, a teenage girl, you know? Right. Like it's, it, it's sort of, it's kind of like, you know, imagine if there's something like endometriosis type of, you know, that level of commonality and feeling sort of gendered, but that, you know, could, was known to be cured by soaking in a specific hot springs. And so you get a bunch of people, or you know, some autoimmune condition. It's weird that I'm the one to say this, but I'm the one with the guitar. If your period cramps are debilitating, like you have to lie down in the dark for several days or throw up, that's not normal. You might have endometriosis, and even if your doctor thinks you don't, probably time for a second opinion. 
The treatments aren't great, but they're better than the debilitating alternative. And at the very least, a diagnosis might get you access to decent painkillers so you can get on with your life. Jingle addendum, uh, Alexis points out that what is most likely to happen is that you'll get labeled as uh, med-seeking if you ask for painkillers for endometriosis, unless you have a particularly sympathetic doctor. Right, Just, right, right. You know, if you don't know, if you're part of a certain social circle, you know a bunch of people who have it, and otherwise you've probably heard about it on the internet. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and so, but it... it you know, you having to go and soak in this specific, you know, basically do a road trip and go soak in this specific spring about it definitely gives it the flavor of being a sort of codified, you know, adulthood ritual. Um, right. Where it's sort of you have to either commit to moving forward or you get stuck with the face on the back of your neck being your face, as happens to our to our hero. <laughs> um, yes. Whose name is Dolores, which is a name that I love. Um just in literature generally, I mean, obviously it's what Lolita is short for, um, but just like, you know, imagine if your name is Sorrowful. Right. You know? And that's, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> you know, that's just what your name is. <laughs> it's like, thanks mom, <laughs> you know, or dad or whoever gave me this name. <laughs> yep. But in, in fact, it turns out that she is the Sorrowful one. And uh, so how, how do she you has. interpret, how do you interpret her? her friends getting over the face ish or getting to keep their, their front faces and her having to deal with just having her back face. Well, I mean, it's really clear that, our, that Dolores is stuck in this pattern. Like she cannot make her peace with her cringy adolescent self and she cannot say, and she cannot deal with her feelings for her best friend who she's in love with. She can't either just like disengage and crush on somebody else or say something. She just spends the entire time sort of third wheeling it uh, to the increasing resentment of the girlfriend um, and, you know, occasionally sort of trying, you know, occasionally sort of joining in their makeouts. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there, it, it feels very like. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it feels very relatable, if not necessarily to my personal experience, but like that sort of, you know, third wheeling it and, and everybody's drunk. So I, you get to have like a tenth of what you want, but you're never going to get yes. the, the other the other 90 percent, you know. Right, exactly. And there's this and because like this, this, the entire story drips with, oh, look how her girlfriend doesn't appreciate her. Look how her girlfriend isn't cool enough for her. Well, you know, her girlfriend's the girly girl who even puts makeup on her neck face. And, you know, and I, I appreciate, I see how beautiful she is. I appreciate her. I would be cool. Um, just like running through the story. <laughs> yes. No appreciation for how difficult it must be to put makeup on your neck face, incidentally. Right. And also, I mean, you know, and also like the the um, the point of this love triangle is somebody who eats a live tarantula and then it crawls out of the neck face of her girlfriend. Um, right. They, they clear, is, they're, they're clearly connected. <laughs> you know, that's that's some intimacy right there. They're clearly connected. And, you know, like. It's not necessarily a healthy relationship. It really grosses her out that she's eating spiders, and she's totally willing to eat a spider, even though it's going to c get completely freak out the um, the tarantula, even though it's going to crawl out of the you know onto the back of her girlfriend, who is incredibly freaked out. Like none of these people are necessarily in a healthy relationship, but mm -hmm. just because your crush is in a suboptimal relationship doesn't mean that like you would actually you know. This is not the Taylor Swift song. <laughs> yes. Um, um, I'm, I'm assuming that the Taylor Swift song question is she wears sh short shorts yes. over sneep snops. Yes. Yes, um, exactly. I hope that it, perhaps you can uh, provide a cover with those words. Um, <laughs> um, she wears snorp snorps. I wear sneep snops. She's cheer captain. I play Roblox. Dreaming about chicken dinners in Fortnite. Sticking out my gat for the Rizzler all night. Ah. Uh, 
I what? I think I blacked out for a second. <laughs> anyway, um, like I just th- that is the thing that I most like about this story is just all I've seen this dynamic played out so many times when I was in high school and college, and and you know and it 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 rarely resolves happily for anyone, but like this sort of I can you know she's the sense of her being just completely stuck in all these different ways and. She's clearly decided it's never going to be her fault. Like, it's the girlfriend's fault. It's her the fact that her neck face still has braces is fault. Um, right. And so what, and that means, because she's so invested in the idea that, you know, her inability to move on with her life is always somebody else's fault, that when she's sort of plunged into the curse-breaking spring, the curse that breaks is her own selfhood, leaving only this like repressed adolescent. Yeah. It's a, it's a really, it's a nasty, it's a good metaphor and it's a nasty one too. You know, yeah. it's like, there's a, there's a much actually next time we do short fiction roundup, we'll do, there's a Zen Cho story, which is like the sort of ex- incredibly more cheerful spin on this exact, uh, this very similar trope. And so that would make a fun uh, comparison mm-hmm. when we do our next short fiction roundup someday. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like to, to kind of, bring connections between these three stories it's like we we've uh these are these are both these are all three of them like very simple narratives um where like one thing happens little almost nothing in two of them almost nothing happen uh in terms of you know there, there's not a lot of there's one event in um in mm-hmm. nuka there's basically zero major events in selkie stories and miss bulletproof does have a lot of action but it's all very compressed and quick yes um and it's like this is i mean you can say well they're short stories but f- with many of the short stories that we've read already a lot of things happen in the in the space right. of you know the small thing and it's like you know and this isn't a criticism of these stories uh, it's just like clearly you know this is sort of what's happening here and, well, and it's, i think it's a thing that short fiction it's a thing that short fiction can do in a way that long form prose fiction is much harder because if you read you read an entire novel where nothing happens and you know some authors can still pull that off but I'm totally willing to read 3500 words where basically nothing happens that's just like you know a vibe and in, and some introspection and like capturing a moment in time I it's my the guitar is right here but I I I couldn't bring myself to start playing the book of love again <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, I mean, a lot yeah. happens in that book. <laughs> it's true. But, uh, regardless, um, so yeah, no, this is something that, as you say, short fiction is, uh, is ideally suited for. Um, and these particularly Nuka had, and actually Nuka and Saki stories both feel almost like prose poems. Mm, yeah. Partly because they're just very careful prose. Mm. To pad this episode out, I'm going to recite one of my favorite prose poems by Charles Baudelaire from his collection Paris Spleen. This poem is called The Soup and the Clouds, or La Soupe et les Noages. My dearly beloved little lunatic brought my dinner. As through the open dining room window I contemplated the restless shapes that God creates from vapor, the wondrous forms of the impalpable. And I said to myself, amid my contemplation, all this phantasmagoria is well nigh as lovely as the eyes of my beautiful beloved, my monstrous little lunatic with green eyes. All of a sudden I received a violent blow on the back and heard a husky yet charming voice A hysterical voice, as if hoarse with brandy, the voice of my dear little love, saying, Will you go on and eat your soup, you damned fool of a cloud merchant? I mean, even even Miss Bulletproof, actually, like, the specific, it's very much going for, like, a real sort of nonstop flow of words. It's just more of, like, a slam poetry poem. The Dashiell Hammett, you know, noir poet kind of a deal. Right. Um... And uh, so it's like we're going to make the form as beautiful and evocative as possible, but we're going to, you know, do one simple story that you've that you've read before, 
uh, or that mm-hmm. you've you've seen before, you know, in one form or another, because these are right. these are all old tropes, you know, maybe with a little bit of a twist because they're all lesbian, um, where and, they wouldn't have been I mean, before. I, I do feel like Nuka is pushing the, you know, is is a little bit more out there trope wise than the other two. <laughs> oh, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I'm not, and I'm but, not, I'm right, not saying like, any of this to 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 minimize it because, like, oh, saying, no. oh, it's just a coming of age story. Oh, it's just you know a buildings roman. You know, it's like right, exactly. This is just, you, know, you know how much Nuka, of our of our fiction. You know, but uh, it's just um, Miss Bulletproof and Silky stories both are very obviously consciously engaging with like a specific genre. Um, a specific kind of story, a noir, you know, like a noir story with some superhero elements, a selkie story. And Nuka feels a little bit more out there just because of, it, it's a coming of age story with a particularly interesting body horror twist. This is true. And, but it's also, it's like, you know, I always wonder when I, when I'm, when I read a story that is so, you know, um, drenched in another culture's like, uh, sort of, um, uh, environment in this case, like you know, what That's true. What, are, what are we missing? What am, from... what am I missing as a, as a white dude, you know, <laughs> um, or as an American? Uh, and but and so and I don't know in this case, but it's like it's it is sort of I think that Nuka is trying to make is trying to alienate you, like in a sort of um. I don't want to say like Brechtian way, but like in a, like the way that it uses language is meant to stop you, you know, and make you you down and slow you down and make you have to like really think about everything that's happening. Um, And like, I think that it it, it really is um, sort of pushing you into viewing this from as alien a perspective as possible. Like, even if you do come from, you know, within that sort of framework, because it's also using a bunch of like really difficult and weird English words, which will stop you if you're coming at it, you know, as a Spanish speaker. Um, I mean, you can be fully bilingual, so. Yeah, yeah, but, but I'm, even fully, then, I'm fully know, fluent in English and I had to stop and look at what, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, um, and I mean, you know, also, even if the pace of the language doesn't slow you, the imagery is going to, I mean, you know, the... How like one of these faces is beautifully made up and the other one has like a blackened tongue and yellow teeth. And this moment where suddenly everything's sort of moving quickly and dreamily and then you stop and this woman just like shoves an entire tarantula in her mouth. Um, right, right, right. No, you the, know, uh... the, the, sort of, the way that it sort of swings between this very pretty dreamy imagery and then this much more nightmarish dreamy imagery. Um, yeah. I don't want to throw magical realism realism at it just because it's you know Latin American, but there's there's a bit of it that, there's of a, yeah. the, the old magical realism in there. <laughs> um, but I I just find it interesting how like that that feeling of being you know forcibly the forcible strangeness of it as opposed mm-hmm. to the sort of familiarity of aggressive like, relatability of sulky stories, right? And how <laughs> exactly and how like that's it's such a it's such a different you know and i think they're both effective like i'm not saying yeah. that one's better than the other but i just think that it's like it's 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 a very different way of trying to get over a familiar concept you know of trying to communicate a familiar concept you in one it's like we we put you right in the context so you see how familiar you are with this story and then it you know does the twist right and in another one it's like you are not familiar at all and then you see what's happening yeah um Cool. And in both, and you know, great, and yeah, and it's it's two very different ways of that are still sort of getting at the heart of what it is like to be a queer teenage girl. Right, exactly. You know, you what know, one is more high school and one's more cases. college, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very weird and so. awful. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's really interesting because though, because um, you know, in that even in that Nuka is something of a coming of age story. I mean, it's a failed coming of age story, but also. It's it's not a teenage coming of age story. It's like a t- early twenties coming of age story, which is mm-hmm. nice. Like it's nice to see coming of age stories that aren't about teenagers because actually being there, you're sort of always coming of age in a way. <laughs> um, it's just a different age each time. Now, the last um, time I made this argument, you told you 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 made fun of me for being like, well, why can't stories be about forty year olds? Uh, but um, I, I but think, yes, no, I agree I, with I'm you. I'm in favor of put, making stories about 40-year-olds. 
<laughs> Stories yeah. should be about 40 year olds. Um, Thank and, you. But you know, I, I didn't think I was making fun of you. I thought I was agreeing with you. Um, no, 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 no. You, this is, this is, I'll, I'll edit this out, but this is from our, uh, yeah. from our book of love episode when I was like, you know, maybe fairy tales should be about older people at this point in time. Oh. Because, you know, people are getting older and well, you're like, are you sure you just don't want fairy stories to be about you? And I was like, well, you know. <laughs> I but. mean, <laughs> um, like, it's, it's not that I disagreed with the underlying uh, idea. <laughs> it's just, um, it, this is very specifically a coming of age that is about an adult, and but is still very much capturing a transitional moment in life. Um, really, all of these are capturing transitional moments in life. I mean, there's also the really sort of accepting that whatever, you know, that like... The, the things you got to do in your 30s are behind you. you you're actually going to have to be boring now um, uh, to miss Bulletproof. Yeah, the Lord forgive me, but it's time to get back in my bullshit. You know, Bugs Bunny with a gun t-shirt has arrived in your <laughs> in your life, um, and you have to decide whether you're going to put it on or not. Like, that's a, that is another sort of transitional moment in life where you have to decide, am I going to move on or, and settle, you know, and like make the peace with the compromises that I've made? Or am I going to try to force, am I going to try to like force recapture my youth and have my weird, like, this is also kind of a midlife crisis story. Um, That's true. It's like, am I going to get divorced? (laughs) Um, Right. You know, in, in so many words. Right. And the answer in this one is basically no, you know, she she starts to, and then she has this realization that actually she's really devoted to her wife and kids, and that the stuff she was doing in her 30s, 20s and 30s was actually really terrible, and time, you know, actually, no, I'm going to commit to the boring life. Um, yeah, I mean, except she kind of feels that way the whole way through, because she she does the thing with a lot of resentment, and just because the she feels like it would be really useful to have the money. Um, yeah, but she still does it. But she does still do it. And and she, I guess she has to learn, learn that it's not even worth the cash. Uh, right. Past a Which certain she doesn't point. even get. She only gets half. Um, yeah. I do want to, I did want to say that I think there was something that was interesting to me about, um, about uh, Mrs. Bulletproof here, or, you know, Miss Bulletproof comes out of retirement was that, uh, the the sort of the god you know the the sort of conception of de- of deities was you know familiar obviously from mm-hmm. the you know Pratchett Gaiman Alan Moore you know yeah you know modern wizard divinity school but um, there it wasn't quite the same because um, mm-hmm. like the, uh, the this one was very much being like okay these gods aren't even like conscious. They're just sort of uh, hollowed out archetypes. Yes. Yes. The, 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 the threat is, oh, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to deify you. <laughs> right. Which is like, you know, and I think that if as there is sort of something clever in there that is like, you know, if my if I allow my 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 role, my identity as Miss Bulletproof to, you know, be all that is left of me. Mm-hmm. If I keep chasing this thing into, you know, far after I should have, you know, settled down and become more of a real person, uh, then eventually that will be it. And there will be nothing left to me. And there will yeah. be no no room in my life for like a wife and kids, for example. So, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, I, I thought that I thought that was good. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I so thought did that, I. that was relatively cool. Um, uh, and so, you know, I like that. That's I think that that is the common thread in our stories is that each is about sort of being stuck in this transitional moment in your life and going, am I going to move past it or am I going to wallow? Mm. Um, and we get, we get two move pasts and one wallow and the wallow doesn't Liter- turn out very well. <laughs> Literally wallowing. Um, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very good. Um, <laughs> I had to, I had to, <laughs> uh, you know, I opened my mouth to call for help and the brackets cut my cheeks. And I was like, the, your brackets? Uh, <laughs> but I, get those, I guess technically that is what those are called. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Besieged by punctuation. But. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. The idea of going back to having braces. What a nightmarish thought. <laughs> I, I was I was lucky enough to never to never have them, which is why my teeth look like this. And mm-hmm. uh 
audio listeners. And um, just imagine imagine some teeth. Um, <laughs> Isaac sure does have some teeth. I have vampire fangs. I have vampire fangs. I have vampire fangs. And I occasionally dangle one over my lip like an anime cat girl. One hates the thought of... Uh, Despite what some um, dentists with dollar signs in their eyes have told me over my adult life, uh, one hates the thought of getting braces at this point. Um, I mean, fair. Yeah. Um, all right. So, well, I mean, it's, it's a relatively short one, but that's it's relatively it's short, short one, fiction, but I mean, short episode. Yeah, like there's there's significantly few. We read significantly fewer words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I think these three together are like, you know, uh, a, 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 f- a fraction of... Uh, yeah, these, these three together, I'm pretty sure, is not much more than 10,000 words, so... Indeed. Under 12, um, okay, I'm pretty sure. So uh, we're going to be doing... Um, if we haven't already done Metal from Heaven, we're going to be doing Metal from Heaven at some point. I, I still yeah. am not, like, entirely sure how this is going. We have Lady Eve's Last Con coming up, if not, which is, I guess, probably another noir, you know. Miss Bullock no. comes out of retirement. No! No! <laughs> No. Not really. <laughs> okay, I don't know anything about it. Lady Eve's last con is um, sparkly. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. I I found it very charming, but like it's very it's very fluffy uh, in many ways, and not it's it's more of a sort of you know glamorous con heist type thing as opposed to very noiry. Indeed. Um. So. And uh, we will eventually, uh, and we will eventually get to both of those episodes. But we are getting close to episode one hundred now. Um, and as you know what that uh, means, faithful listeners will know that means it's time to watch a cartoon, and we're going <laughs> to watch a uh, a cartoon where you know with, that I with, believe has been requested by our listeners. Indeed, it has, and there's definitely some you know heavily implied gay content in this <laughs> cartoon. So yes, uh, look forward to that. Um, yes. And uh, until until uh, until we meet again, and also we should we should have some bonus episodes coming up. Yeah. Uh, talk to you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.